I still remember being back in high school and how much I enjoyed chewing gum. It was a valuable commodity back then for everybody. But it wasn't until I went to college to become an evolutionary biologist that I started to realize just how exciting it is that I can chew anything at all. Chewing didn't evolve until around 370 million years ago, during the Devonian period. That's when the natho stones, or the first jawed fishes, first popped up. Particularly, one of my favorite, Dunkel Ostrich, was probably the first jawed fisher, really, the first jawed anything, who appeared in the fossil record. It blows my mind to think that those fishes they were an invention that we've been using for almost 400 million years just to let me chew gum today. Isn't that neat? That, my dear Deuterra Stones, is Hedy Lamarr. She was an actress during the 1930s and 40s, and she was an astounding scientist. She would sneak off to her trailer in between shoots just to run experiments all day long. And she invented something called frequency hopping, which is a way for torpedoes to have their guidance computers constantly switching between different radio frequencies so that they couldn't be tracked by enemy vessels. And she donated that invention to the United States government to help out during World War II. She never earned a single dime for any of her inventions, but it's estimated that frequency hopping alone is worth about $30 billion because it went on to produce GPS and Wi-Fi and Bluetooth and just cell phones in general. That woman right there was a silver screen superstar, a brilliant inventor, and a freaking American hero. It's a common misconception that helium changes the sound of your voice. The truth is, my vocal cords are vibrating at the exact same frequency, but when they do, they produce one solid sound that vibrates all throughout my throat and my mouth, and that resonance produces a variety of sounds that make up my unique voice. Now, sound waves can travel through helium about three times faster than they can usual air, and that's what's important, because the higher pitch frequencies that are always in my voice are able to propagate a lot faster, and that's what you're hearing. It changes the timbre of my voice, not the actual sound. So even though those higher pitch frequencies were always there, you just don't notice them unless they're traveling so much better with this light gas. How cool is that? I want to show you something that keeps me up at night. Okay, here I've got a number line. One, two, three, four, five, all the way to infinity. Now we can all agree that this infinity contains a lot more numbers than any amount of numbers that we could write between, say, three and four, right? No, because I could write 3.1, and then 3.11, and then 3.111 an infinite amount of times. And I could do 3.2 and 2.2.2, or 3.98742, whatever, because any number that you put after 3, I could just add a 1 or a 2 to and make a new number. That's infinity. An infinite amount of infinities, all contained between just these two numbers. And these two, and these two, and these two. This infinity contains an infinite amount of smaller infinities, because some infinities are bigger than other infinities. And that is crazy as shit to think about. As you start to learn physics, and you start to think about the world in physical terms, you'll realize that certain properties don't actually exist. It's just the absence of other properties that you're observing. So like, for example, cold. Cold does not exist. It's just the absence of heat. Heat is energy given to a molecule, make the molecule vibrate all around. When the molecule vibrates slowly and doesn't have that energy, that's what we call cold. So there's no such thing as cold, there's just a lack of thermal energy. Same thing with suction. There's no such thing as suck. It's just a lack of air pressure. When I drink through a straw, I'm making a low pressure system in my face, and then all the air pressure of the whole world all around me is trying to balance that out by pushing on the drink, and the drink has nowhere else to go, but through the straw balances it out. And when you think about things that way, you'll start to see other things that way, like maybe people. Maybe there are no bad people. Maybe they just have a lack of kindness and you can give some of yours to balance it out. And then you remember that that's nonsense. People aren't molecules, they're jerks.
So I'm sitting in a hotel room in Utah, drunk on soba noodles and finishing some final lesson plans before a video shoot tomorrow, and I thought I'd take a second to tell you about the evolution of mammals. You see, mammals are classified by the presence of fur and mammary glands, mammary mammal. But when you ask most people about what it is to be a mammal, they'll very often say that it involves giving live birth. But that's not always applicable. In fact, for the first hundred million years or so of our existence, it wasn't applicable to any of us. Mammals first popped up in the fossil record about 220 million years ago, and for a very long time, we laid eggs and then gave milk to whatever came out of those eggs, the same way that the monotremes, the platypus and the echidna, still do today. It wasn't until 125 million years ago that Aomea, or Dawn Mother, popped up in northern China, and that funky little shrew was the first thing in the fossil record to have a placenta. So take a second to thank Aomea for existing, because without it, you wouldn't. That little hole that some people get in the front of their ears is called a preauricular sinus, and they're absolutely right to call it their gills, because that's exactly what it is. You see, lungs first evolved around 390 million years ago, and it caused a little split. Some fish kept the lungs and used them to become better fish by modifying them into swim bladders. That's right, lungs evolve first, and swim bladders are just modified lungs. How cool is that? But then we kept the lungs, crawled up on land, but also kept the gills and used the gills to make things like our lower jawbone and our outer ear. So having a gill slit here is just kind of a genetic hiccup. It is a vestigial structure. And it's not the only mark of our lowly origins. For example, the recurrent laryngeal branch of your vagus nerve, which controls your voice box. The vagus nerve goes all the way from the brain, down around your heart, and then back up to your neck. Because in fish, all those things are out on top of each other, so it's just a straight shot. But remember, evolution is not an inventor, it's a tinkerer. So it can't just unplug and plug it in, it just stretches stuff. Take a snail with your hand. By far, my favorite way to introduce students to concepts in thermodynamics is with a cotton candy machine. The machine works because of this spinning hot plate here in the center. The disc is so hot that sugar melts instantly when it hits it. Then it's forced out through little holes in the side of the plate through centrifugal force. And as it extrudes through those holes, it cools down instantly when it hits the air. Then convection currents, because heat rises, forces those strands up into these wispy, beautiful little ribbons. And you can very quickly create a whole powdered wig for the cotton candy. Not only is this an amazing way to introduce concepts that can be pretty difficult for kids, changes in matter and convection currents and force and energy and heat and all these different things, but it's also delicious. Oh, mmm, got some tasty science right there. Hey there. Did you know that sperm whales are the loudest animals on the planet? They are so loud that their vocalizations can easily just shatter your eardrums or literally vibrate your organs apart. They can kill you with just clicking. <laughs> uh, yeah. You have fun thinking about that today. Bye-bye. That thing that you just saw there, that's a robot. That is an autonomous, self-driving machine full of food. A marvel of technology and advancement and innovation. And you just watched it carefully maneuvering around a homeless person. Now, am I about to sit here and try to accuse Postmates and the robots of all the problems in the world? Of course not. But the juxtaposition is striking. 
We have a helicopter on Mars at this moment. And yet, we as a society still can't seem to tackle the problem of how to make sure everybody has food and shelter. I refuse to believe that I'm the crazy one for thinking that we can do better than this. <laughs>